On that note, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for gathering us here together. Give us hearts open to your word and souls listen to your will. May we today in this conversation and discussion learn more about who you are and love you more deeply. We entrust this time to you through the hands of our Blessed Mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, can we say a little prayer for the people in Turkey and Syria? Absolutely. Let's say uh, Hail Mary for them as well. Lord, we uh, let the people over there are suffering. We be protected from conflict and everything else may be uh, eased and their pain and suffering can be abated. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father in the Son of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. I just saw it right before I came, so I'm just, you know. What do you say? Over 3,000. Over 3,000. And they had like four large earthquakes that were over six, I think, weren't they all? Where is that What's at? That? In yeah. Turkey. There was four huge earthquakes yeah. starting last night at six o'clock, and then they just kept happening. Yeah. And there's Seven, thousands of people so like eight. trapped and stuff. Oh, God. Yeah, was, and they weren't that deep either. not as a scientific treatise, but as family stories sitting at the feet of God. Um, sitting at the feet of someone coming before us, telling us who the Lord is, uh, what our obligations are, who we are. And so there's three main things we're looking at. Who God is, who we are, our destiny, we're made for, why we're here, and pointing to our Lord. Predicament, prophecy, and explanation of what who the Lord is coming. And so we learn bits and pieces at a time. Right? It's not all in, all in one, um, not all in one big lump. We get pieces. From, and we see stories building each other and carry each other, and we see themes and ideas and truths carry through. We also see things where, um, for us, we're kind of used to seeing things backwards. Because we're living in the future. We're prepared to have every body back in the past for us. We have to remember that from God's eyes, from God's point of view, He is the first author of the scriptures. Everything is present. And so for the, for, this, for the Old Testament, these are deliberate prophecies and prefigurements of our Lord, and they're unraveling, they're unraveling for us. But it's fulfilled and proclaimed Jesus Christ. They are explaining and putting into our focus and our presentation who our Lord is delivered. And so there are layers upon layers upon layers. And so again, I'm not covering everything. We're not going to be able to hit everything, obviously. Uh, we're going to be hitting highlights. And at least in this chapter, I think most of these stories are going to be pretty familiar to us. And so I'm not going to begin to cover in great detail the, the verses themselves. Now, if I has ever something I'm assuming it's really familiar to everybody and it's not, stop me and we'll look at the scripture itself. Um, so I'm going to assume that most of these, these cases in this day, probably the next few to two weeks, that the stories that we're covering are pretty well done. Today we're going to try to get three stories, um, Cain and Abel, Noah, and highlights of Abraham's life. Um, and again, I'm going to be taking things out, I'm covering everything so we just can't. So if I switch over to, brush over things too quickly, don't be afraid to slow me down, or ask questions or anything like that. Talk to the father, we're going to offend me. Um, and so I'm going to 
put a couple of different things, and, but I'm not going to be covering this in great detail, just because we could spend the rest of our lives becoming any one of these stories, and unpack them, and rather than discussing them and seeing what they mean. But the Lord is just so wise, these things are so beautiful, uh, what we're being given here. So that being said, the story of Cain. And remember the context is Adam and Eve have been run out of the garden. They've fallen, and now they begin to probably look. They do so now, passing on original sin, passing on this, these stages for disharmony. We talked about last time, there were these four harmonies that was destroyed in the, in, the, in the fall. Now there is a disharmony, there is a war between man and God, between Man and man, because of original sin, because of the passion, because of the inside of us. Between ourselves and ourselves, there is this fight between man and nature. This is passed on now to other human beings. You see this very clearly in Genesis chapter 5, where it says that we're not only made in God's image and likeness, but we're also made in Adam's image and likeness. We have his image and his likeness, his state of being, his reality. And so we, we inherit. The story of Adam and Eve, that the story of Cain and Abel, that builds off of what happens to Adam and Eve and shows how the effects of sin, because remember, they were conceived and grow up, not in a state of grace, like Adam and Eve were, <coughs> not knowing God face to face, but in a state of the living world of the fall. And so we see now how sin is a deeper hole in the universe. In the story of Cain and Abel, we know, we have Cain and Abel who our, uh, Abel is a shepherd. Cain is a uh, tiller of the soil. He grows fruits and vegetables. They're offering sacrifice to God, and Abel sacrifices to prove that Cain is jealous and means. So he calls his brother out to the field by himself one day and he kills him. And God asks him where your brother is, and Cain goes, I don't know. How do I know? Because I'm not my brother's keeper. I'm a gardener. I don't care. I care. I'm not that. My brother's keeper. And again, we have that theme there we talked about last time where God lets the wicked have to defend themselves. He's a just judge. And God, who doesn't know sin, punishes Cain. Cain makes a mercy, as a mercy where he's not killed, but is sent to one of the earth. There's a lot here. One of the things that's interesting to me is if you look at the end of the story of Genesis, Genesis 3 the Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve's sin, their crime, ends up with the depiction of the punishment of death. You are dust, and the dust is shall return. You have there, Genesis chapter 322, you have a description of what's going to happen to Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve were sent from the garden, clothed in other garments. Or ready to have a sacrifice for their life. The Lord God said, see, the man has become like one of us. And that plural, hint in the Trinity. He's become like one of us. Knowing what is good and what is bad. Therefore, he must not be allowed to put his, out his hand to take the, the fruit from the, the tree of life also. And let's eat of it and live forever. The Lord God therefore banished him from the Garden of Eden until the ground which he had been taken. So there is this tendency of death. But, with Genesis chapter 4, 13, Cain says to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. You banish me from the soil, I must avoid your presence from the rest of this wanderer, and it will kill me at sight. Not so the Lord said. If anyone kills Cain, Cain should be avenged sevenfold. So the Lord put a mark on Cain so that everyone should kill him at sight. Cain. So no, less than anyone should kill him at sight. It's interesting because Genesis ends in condemnation of death. Cain, who's a murderer, is all for mercy. Why? Why does the apple end in this cycle of death? But Cain is given this mercy. A couple of things going on here. 
And the first thing that we have to realize, we're told by this, is that God is not about that. God is not making it. We have to get that whole story from last time. The point was, God is the creator of everything that's good. Even like the myths, where evil has a source and origin in the divinity, death and evil is a, is a falling away from what's true, what's good, from the divine. So God doesn't make that. God doesn't want that. God does not rejoice in that man living being. This is very clear with the Book of Wisdom. See, we're told here that death has three realities. <clears throat> death is natural. Death is a punishment. Death is also a mercy. So these three themes are run throughout the reality of what death is. The human race. Those are something very important to find about who we are. How is death natural? Death is natural to us because of our we're made. How does God make us? God creates out of dirt. <laughs> dirt? God creates out of dirt and because human beings, and God creates the universe out of nothing. Ex nihilo. And so therefore, our natural state is dirt, dust, water's return, and nothingness. And so without God, where are we going to end up? Back to our natural state, dirt and nothingness. See, life, the tree of life, would have prevented us from dying. The Lord God doesn't cause death, he removes something that would have caused life. For a reason. The Lord didn't say, I'm going to kill Adam, he says, well, they must not take the tree of life. Lest they live forever. So they may were allowed to go back to their natural state. So by ourselves without God, man's nothing, we die. It's natural to us, and uh, things naturally break down. Things don't by themselves get built up and grow, and that takes something else on the outside. Naturally, by ourselves, we fall apart. Only with God, only God's the creator. It's a punishment. <laughs> because in God's original plan, had we listened to Him, we would not die. Death wasn't part of what God wanted. God wanted us to live, He made us to be His own children, to live forever. But we chose death. And so, as a consequence, we die. And so there's an element where it's punishment. God removed something from us and us to have. We would have been in this natural consequence. We would have been mortals. If the trees and the plants and the animals would die, we wouldn't have died. We would have had life here on earth and descended to heaven body and soul not death. Because of the tree of love. And so, we, so there is a punishment where death and suffering comes about because we reject God. We're also told here, as being revealed to us here in the story of Cain and Abel, that death is a mercy. See, when God says, I don't want them to live forever, he's not saying, you know, deserve it, I'm good enough, I want, I want them to have this. Otherwise, he'd be killing Cain for his prison witness. He would say, you don't deserve this, or I don't deserve mercy, I hate you, ha ha, let me suffer. Don't see that. God is kind to Cain. God weeps over what Cain has done. God comes and approaches Cain and he tells him, repent. Cain is not going to die and says, hey, God, I'm so sorry for what I've done. Forgive me, help me. God goes to Cain. God comes to him. God seeks out the sinner. God seeks out and says, help. You need help. You're just killing yourself. So he treats us as his children and as his beloved. And so death, therefore, isn't just a punishment. Not just God being angry and hurting us. It's a mercy. How is death a mercy? Nobody wants to live forever. What we do? Nobody wants to be here. We want to live forever here in this state. See, if I haven't even lived forever in the state of rejection or from God, there would have been no hope for salvation. There would have been no hope for real mercy for change. 
As the Lord is removed from your life, the ability to live forever so there can be an end to suffering, and a chance of redemption and forgiveness. So this allows God uses what we've done. God's so good he can use our wickedness, even though even we've done to bring about change and mercy and salvation. For it allows for an end to suffering, an end to the mess we can make, a limit to how bad we make this world. And without this, we could be unlimited in how bad we make it. There's limits now. Lord says, only so far. And it allows them for salvation. And later on, we'll see in addition, not just the limit of suffering, but every bit of suffering he counts. And he redeems, and he will hold the wicked accountable, and he will hold the just, reward, give the just the reward for suffering and everything. And nothing is lost for God or Lord. But we're being told here is this limits and salvation. And whenever you see death, you see these three themes kind of woven throughout the scriptures. It's natural for us to die, our own fault. It's a punishment. We deserve it. It's something we did. But there's always mercy. And that is very, very important for us to recognize us. Important for us to realize this is this is going on. And God is so good. Going back again to God's goodness. God is so good that He can bring goodness out of our evil. And this whole scripture, in a certain way, is proven. This whole Bible. This whole library of books is proving how God does that. How God as goodness brings about salvation, a deeper union, a deeper, a bigger salvation, and a greater happiness in spite of ourselves. In spite of our wickedness, our stupidity, and our rejection of our Lord, God is so good and wise and wonderful to us, there is a deeper union, a closer relationship, and a greater love. God does more of himself because of our wickedness. God gives more of himself because of our fault. God comes to us more closely, more deeply, and more fully. And brings us higher from heaven in spite of ourselves. That's the scripture. That's the story. And so we're being shown here, first of all, who God is. The goodness of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, how much God calls to us. Or we're being shown who man is. We have, again, you compare this to the scriptures. We can get the scriptures to the myths. And the myths, the wicked, they repent, they must seek the gods out. They must prove their worth to gods. They must suffer greatly in order to be worthy of the gods. The gods in Mount Olympus or other places in the heavens, and, and they wait for the human beings to figure the things out. There is a, a um, an author by the name of Brother Brian the last name. Shoot, not a blank. Brother Brian something or other. Very important, guys. Uh, an, an Anglican convert. convert. And he says when he was looking at, uh, he was struggling with his own faith and his own beliefs. He realized that only in Christianity is God nobler than man. Because of all the myths, you, you have the man who struggles to with great suffering and trials and knows himself to become like God. And God just back like, cool, good job. Here's your, here's your gold star. In Christianity, in the Bible and the Scripture, God is nobler than man. Because God suffers, God does the work, God comes to us. We're the ones sitting back and going, I don't know what to do, I'm falling away from you, I'm making mistakes, I'm falling apart. And God will come into us, seeking us out, pulling us together, and taking upon our suffering upon himself. God is nobler than man. God is greater than man. In most of the myths, man is greater than God, nobler than God. 
The gods are nasty and jealous and wicked, and, and we have to deal with that and suffer with that and overcome that. Very different. Very, very different. So who God is, who man is, and what our calling is. God doesn't give up on us. Doesn't abandon us, doesn't reject us, but calls us to what? Even the murderers who reject them, those who fall away from them, those who abandon them. <clears throat> and remember, in the context, traditionally this was written by Moses, given to the people who liberated from Egypt, who were constantly falling away from God, constantly rejecting God, constantly grumbling against Him, constantly struggling to follow Him. What they're being told is, God knows who you are, your weaknesses, your fidelities, your sins, your struggles, and he seeks you up. And he seeks you up. So another theme you find constantly throughout the scriptures is that God calls first. God comes to us. We don't do a whole lot by our own. We have to do nothing. Please come. Um, excuse me for being a little ignorant, but um, God has gotten mad at us, though, in Scripture. Um, destroying a city or the flood. Um, so hold that thought, because we're going to cover it when we get to the next story in Noah's Ark. Um, but great thought. If I don't cover it in detail or well enough, please ask again. Uh, but like I, I do intend to, to answer that question. Okay. Um, so we, are, we were meant to be given these things a piece, piece of the time. But excellent question, very important point. We'll come, we'll come to it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we see here is we see here in the story of Cain and Abel the need for sacrifice. There is this innate desire need for us to offer God love. When we love somebody, anybody, because of the love of who we are, some of our bodies and some creatures. If you love carrots, somebody, don't just think of thoughts about them. We're not angels, don't just think at them. You, you, you have to do things for them. You speak nicely to them, you make them things. You, love, you show them your love and affection and care in real ways. And so for God, this is the offer of sacrifice. And we see here in the story of Cain and Abel, already there is the two main kinds. There are the animal sacrifices. And there is the plants, the, the, the purpose of the soil. Later on, we'll see in the, the book of Leviticus, there's the offering of the grain and the wine and the oil. Well, of course, figuring, figuring the sacrifice of Christ and the Eucharist. And so we have already seen the bring shown the sacrifice. And there's kind of like three reasons why these sacrifices. And the first is that God is so great, God is over our life. And the sacrifice meant to be this representative offering of my heart and my life. In every culture around the world, except for the modern culture, I think maybe one or two of the ancient world, the majority, 99% of the ancient world, offer sacrifices to their gods. It's only in the modern world where we believe in gods, we believe in the divinity, they offer sacrifice except in the Catholic Church. Hold the discussion. Um, <clears throat> there's this need for us to show God in a tangible way what we're trying to get. Not that God needs that we need to offer the sacrifice. We need to say in a real way, you are the greatest, you are a king, you're the one we love, and this, this is the giving of our life through this representative gift. But it takes on as well, because of the, the sort of Adam and Eve, I'm not pointing over here. Excuse me. <laughs> so sacrifice has had these three main points. <coughs> First of all, the honor of God. God is creator. God is the origin of my life. God will know everything too. And so we offer him this honor and glory and love, saying, you know what I love and care about. This, this symbolizes my life. It's also offended honor. 
We come to God not as his friends and his children, but as sinners. We come in debt. We come owing God, not just because, simply because he is right or not, but simply in the way that um, a child owes honor to their parents, or a spouse owes love to their spouse, but offended them. We're in debt. We have to pay God back for what we stole. We stole God's honor, God's glory, God's love. We hurt, we offended him. It's now God for sacrifice to appease him. We see here then, already we have here that death becomes cause of life. And so our Lord, even here in this very simple story, is laying the foundation for a couple things. Is that the foundation, of course, for Christ's cross? Perfect adoration of God, a forgiving sin, and cause of life. Is also the foundation for the resurrection. Where yes, we die. There's an end to our suffering, there's mercy involved, but not the end of the story. Because the death then leads to resurrection and new life. Where God does not satisfy us simply say, I limit suffering. I'm going to cause an end to suffering and pain. I'll give mercy in the midst of this. But God is going to then use this, this very thing which we cause, to bring about new life and resurrection and redemption and salvation. So we have here we have the very beginning of this, of this book. The seeds are being planted. The, 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 the beautiful. Uh, um, if, if, this, if this were a, a fictional thing, but it's not, we call it a Chekhov's gun. Do you know that, that, you know that term with a ray device? You know, where Chekhov, the short story writer, he says, if you bring up a gun and check in the first sentence, it has to be a purpose for it at the end of the story. Uh, and so this is their, their Chekhov guns, you know, where there is a purpose for all these things. Where they lay the foundation that makes us understand that God is coming to sacrifice Himself to bring about the resurrection for us, so that we know that when we die, it can lead to our resurrection. Because through Christ's death, my death is redeemed, my suffering is redeemed, my sins are forgiven, and I can glorify God and love Him truly through Jesus Christ. At least my own resurrection. One simple sentence, three children. And to the best of our ability, when we honor God, we try to live like God. Through, yes. Yeah, through the cross and through the re resurrection, that's our reward to be able to go to heaven. His, yeah. His reward. And this goes back, to, yes, yes, this goes back to the very beginning. So we're made of God's image and likeness, we're his children. And the children live, inherit what the, what the parent has, and live with their father. And so God's life is eternal, so he's giving us eternal life. Where we're meant to live and act as his children, as his followers, as, as his friends and companions. Absolutely. Um, leading then, of course, to heaven and eternal. Not just life here on earth, but to eternal. There's an eternal reward because we're, because we're meant to be like our Father, who is in heaven, who rests, and by the shed that rest. Absolutely. It's right, so a very, very simple story. Stories that you can tell a three year old. But you can be unpacking this the rest of your life. What's Pete saying? These very simple sentences. We're also shown in the heart of sacrifice. <laughs> what makes sacrifice worth it? The value of sacrifice doesn't really lie in the value we give. In the case of the cross it does because we're offering that as God. We're offering God's Son. But when it comes to what we are part of it, it's not the value of the gift, right? We, we can never give that anything truly valuable in us by ourselves. Um, because you may have everything is so much less than it. Um, you know, com compared to God, everything is so, I mean, we are so infinitely less than God. You know, anything we offer, like offering, like I offer you a little fly with dirt compared to God. Uh, we can't offer by ourselves anything with why. That's why God himself provides a sacrifice. Abraham's story, we'll talk about that in a minute. 
The heart of sacrifice, our parent then, is our love, our devotion, and giving God the best we can. So why does God reject Cain's sacrifice and bless Abel's? Genesis chapter 4, verses 3, 3 to 4. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the soil. Label brought for his part, brought one of the best firstlings of his flock. It's translated in different ways. I've seen this translated as the chief of the first fruits of the flock, the best of the firstborn, um, the best of the fat. <laughs> I'm not sure which translation you have. Um, I think you have a different book there, Mary, don't you? Than the New American. Oh, um, where's the, where's the good book? <laughs> Where's the one that has all the verses in it? <laughs> there we go. No, that's the one I told the different translation to America. Mine is different. Please read it. Verse 3? Uh, verse 3, yeah. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought some of the first things of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard them. Yeah, just the fat portion of the flock, the first thing of the flock, the chief of the first things. Mm -hmm. That's first thing. Yeah. He gave the best thing. The best, the best. <clears throat> the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not. Cain resented this and was pressed forward. So did Cain hold back from the best for himself? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so Cain's getting something. But it's not. But, but it's not even the best. God doesn't punish Cain. God doesn't say to Cain, you're a wicked man for this. God just says, I'm going to bless Abel. God doesn't condemn Cain. But the fact is that Cain is withholding from God the best. Cain's giving God something. He's giving God his leftovers. Abel's giving God the best in the first machine. It doesn't really say that he gave him the leftovers. It just says that Give him something. But it's, but it's not the first fruit. It's not the best. But it says not the first fruit, not the best, is the implication. Um, so it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not rotten junk, necessarily, but it's not the best first fruits. In the book of Leviticus, it talks about, about the offer of God. God is holding the first fruits, it says. He's holding the first. So the first harvest was considered like the, the cream of the crop. One, because he waited longest for it. It was also seen as kind of the sweetest and the best. So he gave God the best. God is all the best. And um, whether... This is implying that, that, that I'm not, let's, talk, let's talk quite as far as saying Cain gave him with rod and stuff, but it is saying he didn't give him the first fruits. He gave him something, but it wasn't the best. And Cain knew that. He knew that he wasn't giving God the best. Yes. Yeah. He was holding back. And yeah. God looked at that and said poo poo. Well, and again, it doesn't say that God rejected Cain. He's still talking to Cain. It says, God bless David. And, you're, and when Cain gets upset by it, God says to Cain, well, if you do what your brother did, I'll bless you too. And then Cain kills his brother. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, you know. How does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, you know. Before that. So Cain, Cain was the first politician. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Father, yes, sir. Circle back real quick to yeah, the, the uh, um, tree of... Uh, uh, not much in good and bad. Um, you know, uh, God uh, created man with free will. Yes. He still free will in Adam and Eve. And he put this tree there. Was it a test to see if they would follow uh, his uh, commandments, exercise their free will, and, uh, and instead of some kind of, you know, robot throne? And right. So, so there were two trees on there. Okay. Um, there was a tree of life. That's right. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everything God makes is good. Nothing God makes is bad. Everything that God makes because of we because of we we're free can be used badly. Right? And anything in this world can be used badly. And any of our gifts um, that's free can be used to our harm. Um, even even a good fool, you'll read it, it makes you sick. Um, 
All of these things, so, so there, there is a test, it's not just a test. The fact is that these things would have been for us someday, but not at this point. And so by waiting, by um, until we're ready and prepared for it, and giving God that part of our hearts, then we could receive these gifts and blessings that would have been, been done as great good. Instead, by taking them apart from God, or rejecting God, this great harm. So these gifts of God that were for us, that have done us great good, there was a test in the sense that this is not yours yet. And I want you to freely choose me and freely obey me and freely follow me. But it wasn't God setting us up for failure. It wasn't God trying to trick us. It wasn't God saying, and it will, we've got to have this. <laughs> this is mine. It was for us. It's not yours. And by getting it too early and getting it apart from God, we end up really messing ourselves up and everything else. Um, I want to actually circle back to you that reminds me, thank you very much. So is that, that's your question? Yeah. Circle back to something that Tara asked last time. Uh, I do think it's important for her to recognize, and I have much asked her very, very clearly last time. Uh, you asked, um, you know, if Adam and Eve felt all of their gifts and blessings, what hope we get for us? And the fact is, I think this is part of the point then, uh, that by ourselves, death is natural. By ourselves, we fail. Christ says in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, without me, you can do nothing. Because we're nothing. We're nothing in dirt. But with me, looking at chapter 4, uh, 13 says, in Christ, I can do all things. So we're given God's own strength. When Adam and Eve cling to God, they, they're giants. They reject God, they're midgets. As long as David's faithful, he overcomes everything. When he leaves God, he falls. When Solomon is with God, he's the wisest of men. When he leaves God, he's the most foolish. Peter with our Lord is a hero. That our Lord is a coward. So again, by ourselves, we're nothing. With God, we do all things. So the lesson isn't, if they felt what hope is there for us? The lesson is, I know where I need help. I know where my strength lies, my salvation lies, anything else. If I seek it in myself, or the world, the promises, or my buddy, I'm going to fall. It's only in God. And God's always there. And always trying to give it to me. Sorry, uh, Please, yeah. No. So the motivation behind Adam and Eve was, I'm better than you, God. I can do whatever I want. Uh, that and I want the gifts of God without me. Um, it, it was a rejection of God's fatherhood. It was a rejection of um, their need for God. Um, because God would, was going to tell them everything. But they wanted to be like God without needing God. To do it all on their own. And by rejecting God, God's the source of all life, you end up only with death. So they listen to, to, the, to the preacher rather than to God. If so God's a liar, they're telling something the truth. And the preacher is the fallen snake. The preacher was a demon, a fallen angel. Mm -hmm. One more note before we go on, then, is to again, cover this all night here, but we go on to the next, the next story here. Um, something that I just find kind of beautiful and interesting is that you'll see playing throughout Scripture a shepherd thing. Right, and so a lot of the figures, or figures in the Old Testament are shepherds. Abel's a shepherd. A lot of the heroes who symbolize Christ are going to be shepherds. Abraham and Moses and no, no, not, they'll know a sort of, but he's not, not as not as, as clear. Uh, he, he shepherd, he, he, he shepherds all the animals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, Abraham the shepherd, and you know, so all these figures who are pointing to Christ and are, are the patriarchs, they're shepherds. It's interesting to look at that, to kind of see it. So just keep your eyes and ears open for this kind of shepherd theme popping up here and there. Um, yeah. Abel, of course, symbolizes Christ, the innocent blood shed, uh, which cries out to God. But as Hebrews says, Abel's blood cries out for punishment for the murderer. Christ's blood cries out for mercy on those who murder. Any questions on this? The room want to know on looks at some of your, your questions there. So there's so much, so much. It's so, this is so 
beautiful, it's so wonderful. This is, this is this exciting stuff. <laughs> it is, it's almost, it's sad we, we can't spend your days and hours with this one story. Because you give up to the Batman, the whole cement is focusing on those two tribalosis. <laughs> <laughs> But hopefully this is enough to whet your appetite and to help you see this. The story of Noah and the Flood. Again, probably very familiar to all of us. <coughs> Mankind's more wicked, generations of the long, and God's enough is enough, and he's tending to his great, great flood. And first he chooses one man, Noah, who's righteous, and his families, and Noah's three children and their wives. So Noah's wife, Noah and his wife, and the children and their wives. Um, and they build an ark, collect all the animals, flood comes, whoops everybody out. And then uh, after the flood subsides, it's a good beginning. So what's being told here? A couple of things. And the first is, is that God is merciful, but God is not mocked. We can't use God's mercy against him. We can't, we can't, we can't, um, we can't always, we need, there's a sin called presumption, which you're being warned against here. There's two sins that God can't forgive. Despair and presumptions. Both of these because you never ask forgiveness. Presumption says, I need forgiveness. I can do whatever I want, and God will forgive me no matter what. I have to repent or change because God's good, and therefore, you know, I can do whatever I want. This is, this is a warning against this. We can't, we can't have this presumption where, because God's merciful, I can be as wicked as I want to. Like, I'm never going to be with them. I'm never going to be like them. I'm never going to be his child. I'm always, that's going to only be destructive to myself. God's up there, they're winking at, at sin. We can, we can get evil. That would make God back. Or if God were to be like, ah, whatever. And go ahead and hurt each other, kill each other, and lie and steal and cheat. Who cares? Come on in. That's our party at. That, that wouldn't make God good. And so God is merciful, but God is also just and true. God never acquits the, the guilty unless they want to be acquitted. God never lies. God doesn't pretend the guilty or innocent. God's always willing to give the, the guilty the, 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 the forgiveness that they want. God calls them, God seeks them out, God, God gives everyone the opportunity and chance to be forgiven. But God is not going to pretend that the sinners and those who are, are, who are saints, those who are seeking for his help, want his help, are the same. God's not treat those who seek his help and those who reject him in the same way. God is not mocked. God is, God is not, you know, it's a big dumb the uncle, you know, can be fooled. <laughs> you know, he can be good in his presence, living go out and do everyone. He expects sincerity. Expects sincerity and expects truth. And there's going to be a limit to you. And so there is a limit. That in all the world here at this point, only one family retained in this just of God, the rest rejected. In the story, there is a long period of time where Noah's building the ark, preparing for it, getting everything ready. It's not like a week. It's traditionally 120 years where Noah's building the ark and getting ready. And so people have the chance to take the repent if they don't. People have a chance to say something happening here, they don't. It's not like there's not opportunity. It's not like it's a sudden thing. It's not like they were warned. It was sudden when it happened because they weren't expecting it. They'd been told for a very long time. They had seen the animals guy. They'd seen this, this, this project. They'd been seeing all these things. They could repent. They did. All right. So it's, it's not like they had no chance. It's not like they were blindsided. It's not as though like they were given opportunities. It's only no one took it. Only those willing to do it. I have a question. Please. What was like the population at that time? Like the, the earth? Like how many people 
for that is, is a not even question. one person repent. <laughs> I just I cannot wrap my head around that. I, I just can't believe no one helped him either. You know? <laughs> I, just, it's like all, I, I don't know that how many what the population was, but eight humans. That was basically right. That was it. Yep. And it's like you have not even one other person. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I have such a hard time with that. Um, it's possible. We'll look at this in a minute. Um, well. I should look at that, so I don't want to So, for the, the saints talk about the number of sins beyond which God will forgive. In the same way that each of us, in terms of our heartbeats in our life, and then we're going to have to be over, in terms of our breaths, in terms of our steps, the saints say there are a number of sins. And this, isn't, this is both literal and not literal. It's literal in the sense that you get to a certain point, you're not going to make yourself so wicked, so broken, so rich, so hardened that if the Lord to give you more time, it'll put you in a worse place. <laughs> The Lord to, to give us to more opportunities will actually make us worse and more miserable and more people. Um, not true in the sense that if anyone ever asks for forgiveness, the Lord is going to say, no, too late. Too bad for you. And you're sorry for it. Too many. <laughs> that's not the case. But that's the case that because of our own hardness of heart, the Lord is going to say, at this point, death is better. Um... This also is, is, ties into your question. So why at times do we seek God to have this destruction? Why does God call upon the flood, send fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah? Why does God have the Israelites kill certain people, wipe out certain, certain populations, put them under the, the bath? It's because, a few reasons. One is because it's protecting the righteous from the unrighteous. So I said this right now. So there is a warning that is being shown that wickedness has punishment. Second reason is because it's a mercy to those who are being slain, because otherwise they're going to be so hardened and so broken, it's going to cause them or even themselves to damage. And the third reason is the very moment of death and destruction is your final opportunity to ask God's forgiveness. So it's possible that in the middle of the flood, people were crying out to God. We're not told that. But, but in order to be saved and come to the ark, it was too late. <laughs> because they rejected that. <clears throat> um, but is it, is it possible the moment that they saw that it was too late and they were already drowning, the Lord of mercy happening? Yeah. And sometimes the Lord gives calamities or allows calamities. And like, don't stop the cause. He allows these calamities. Um, I guess in the case of Jesus, because it's possible in certain, certain sense. God causes calamities not for the sake of the destruction and anger, but for the sake of the sacred final mercy. C.S. Lewis says, Joy is God whispering to us, pain is God shouting at us. Let me read this from Psalm 32, um, which talks about this. So I don't know what version you all have, but in my Bible, Psalm 32 was on page 564. Um, So verse 8 through 11. Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Right. You love the for you. <laughs> I'll wait for my mind. Oh, it's missing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 just, just so you know, this does say... The Catholic Study Bible, New American Bible. It does say that on there. <laughs> I thought you were bringing last time you bring your, your King James or your doing I, I was going to bring that, but that's Jake's Bible. Oh, okay. Which one should we use? Which one? I have New American. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. So there, every Bible is matched to disadvantages. So that you should bring the original Greek and Hebrew. But barring that, <laughs> the New American, the Advanced New American, is just the version of the Mass. So if you want to use the one closest to Mass, it's this one. Um, if you want to use a closer translation of the actual Greek words, sometimes the words in here um, confuse 
so some of the, some of the meaning uh, because because you're trying to translate the concept and uh, context, which you know isn't always like if I said, "Look, I'm your father to you," mm-hmm. you know, you get the context of what I'm quoting. But that, that, that's just not the problem. They won't. So um, I need to buy a new Bible. <laughs> well, it's fine. The question is, you know, what, 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 what are you looking for? So if you want something closer to the Mass, it's this Bible. If you want closer to the actual words, I would say the Ignatian, the Ignatian Bible, um, which, which is the, uh, the RSVCE, or a Dewey Reams, or the Old English, which is very, very close, but it is these and the thous. And the, um, so there's different advantages depending on what you're looking for. Mine's the um, Revised Standard Second Catholic. Yeah, so I like that one because I think it's a little bit closer to the translation, but it's not the one we use a mass. So you're going to get different. So you're going to hear verses in the mass, and when you hear, you're not going to match what you hear a mass. So it can be confusing. I need so uh, <laughs> exactly the library. Edition, second Catholic edition. Oh wait, Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic edition. Yeah. If you look up RSVC, that's that's the old one, or Ignatian Study Bible, uh, it's the same thing. It's, yeah, it's just yeah. that it was funny that that verse was not in that. <laughs> you know? Yes, that. that. <laughs> but there's one time looking up a verse that was missing in the Middle America. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Psalm 32. <laughs> Psalm of David. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should walk. If you counsel and watch over, not be senseless like horses or mules. With bit and bridle, their temper is curved, as will come to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice in just, is all you up in heart. What's that saying? If you're obedient to God, it's not going to put a bit in your mouth. Horses need bridles so that they fall. The wicked need a bridle. Many sorrows of the wicked. This is God's bridle saying, come back to me. We do it to ourselves. No. The Lord lets us have a possible something. The Lord's up to trying to figure out ways to make us suffer. We do it to ourselves. We do the cause of it. The time for less it happened to us. This is our this last chance to come back to The pain, suffering, sorrow is God's bridle in our mouths saying, come back to me. There's an old army saying. There's no atheists and foxes. <laughs> Right, when, you know, you can, if, so when you're sitting in the bunkhouse and you're just philosophizing, you no, know, whatever. But when death's approaching, people who are fresh are atheists will call upon God and pray. Um, have you ever seen the movie uh, the Lisa of, of the, the Field with the old Sydney movie? Great mm-hmm. right, movie. Um, but if you don't know the reference for me, it's going to be uh, lost on you. There's a character in there who's atheist. Uh, the, 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 the story. The movie is about, about the group of, of German nuns who want to build a chapel and pray for the help of the chapel. And God sends this black uh, Protestant GI to build it, but he doesn't know it. <laughs> very amusing story, very well, well done. But there's this character in there who is an atheist, and who's not only a church who just can't stand the sisters, but at the end he becomes friends with Saint Bernard's character, and he starts going into the chapel. He's a wealthy man, and when he asks why, he says, "Well, insurance." You know, all the, you start giving money and, and, and bricks and things and help all the chapels and shirts. You know, you know, if, if I'm right, there's no guy that didn't lost anything, but if they're wrong, at least I can say, Lord, I built you a chapel. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, <laughs> um, and so we see here that the structure, God is calling back the people who are dying one last time in a very abrupt way, yes or no. Now think about it. No play that away, no dying. Come back to me or not. And so this is this is God's last severe mercy to us. Saying, repent, come back to me, and be saved. Does God get angry? Mm-hmm. Yes and no. <laughs> anger. Is an emotion. Anger is a physical response to wickedness. God is unchanging, and God has no bond. So God does not have anger the way man has anger. God does not have sorrow the way man has sorrow. God does not have 
anything, you know, emotion the way God would be with you, like, oh, Jesus dies because he's a human being. He's God in that. But God is our nature, is not to have emotions. The Bible describes them this way because it's trying to make us understand something. The fact is that God's response, God is unchanging. God's response to wickedness, to evil, is similar to what it would be as though it were. It's not that God changed, see, you know what to be careful about, it's not that God lost his temper and lashed out. It's not that God was up there saying, I got to get somebody. Someone's going to get it. You know, and sometimes as times as parents or, you know, that happens, you know, for a testy child, got my spoon, testy one more time. And you lose your temper, you lash it out, you spank the kid, you scream at them, you lock them. Don't read the scripture that way. The cross is not God up there saying, I'll hit somebody, and you're just saying, here, you guys, hit me, I can take it. And I think we're supposed to read the scripture that way. They'll think, think that God is so angry and upset that he didn't beat somebody up, and he finally got to beat somebody up, then he was appeased. No. Not what's going on. And so it's not that God's up there losing his time, losing his cool, losing his self-control. It's that God is so good that the wickedness is so opposed to who he is, opposed to his love, opposed to his desire for us, that God's not going to stand for it. And so his response, his goodness, is similar to our response would be emotionally. If God has no emotions, God is not led by passion, overcome. But God is led by truth and goodness of love. But God rejects these things and overcomes these things and conquers these things but that we would need anger to do. Um, so God is not angry in the way we're angry, but God's angry in the sense that God hates wickedness, hates sin because they hurt us, harm us, destroy us. He's not going to stand for it. He's not going to be, ah, who cares? Wink, wink, wink. Go ahead and do it. Because that would be hurting us totally. That would be breaking us, destroying us. And so God puts limits to things, ends evil, and the, end, and, the, and the final plan of his is going to do this not by destroying mankind, but by himself dying on the cross. And now that Christ has come and died on the cross, this, this final mercy is being offered to us, no more does God ask for death. No more does God ask for there to be a ban on life. No more does God ask for there to be a flood on us. Now, there'll be an end to all things. So there'll be a second coming, and the Lord will come and say, the end is come. But the Lord isn't going to say to us, you know, go and attack, you know, those, those dirty Protestants, or those dirty Muslims, those dirty, you know, whatever. Go kill them because they were so, so wicked. Or, or, or St. Mary's Church over in Pine Top. Go get them. Sorry, I was broke there. Sorry. <laughs> Well, that was going to be my question. So, this is very convoluted, but you know, when we say that God wants us to kill these people throughout history, is that man speaking or is that God speaking? It depends on when, and where, and why. Uh, in the scriptures, it is God speaking, but there is a limit of context. And it is because we're idiots and we need this preparation and this mercy of those people. Later on, it's man speaking, except for those cases where it's self-defense, right? So if I were to attack you, defend yourself. If I'm attacking you as a country and bring an army upon you, you can defend yourself. Like say World War II. World War II, yeah. Oh, right, I mean, that was a just war. Was every action done by soldiers in that war, or everything done by the U.S. military just? No. I think there were some things we did, did that were very wicked. But as a war, it was justified. Um, and so when you're coming to defending another country, defending ourselves, um, especially when they're allies or neighbors, or people who can't defend themselves, mm -hmm. that, that's justified as long as there is, is a boundary. Like, you're not doing the kind of revenge. Mm -hmm. like, like Ukraine right now. With Russia attacking Yeah. Could be, yeah. And, and some of the things are very complicated, yeah. where, where it's hard, to, for specific instances, to say, well, this is justified. Some are very black and white. Some are very clear. 
some are very complicated, and good people can disagree, because it is complicated. Uh, because you're trying to figure out, in this case, is the evil so bad that doing this other thing, you want to always choose the best good possible. Sometimes the options are, are so limited, the only thing you can do is to do something um, that the severe acts of self defense. Um, but I have to give, it has to be the best I can do, right? If you come after, if you tap me with a big stick, I can't come to beat you up and kill your wife and kids. You know, if you, if there was an old Monty, Monty Python skit, how to defend yourself from a, from a, a banana. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the, 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 old, the old, the old skit was the self defense class or wherever, you know, there's all these people coming in, they're going to instruct them to teach them how to defend themselves. It starts with a banana and then it, the, 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 the joke is definitely come attack them, they shoot some shoot them with a gun. You defend yourself you know, against the banana. You know, obviously, you know, that's unjustified because there's a lot easier way to defend yourself. It's not going to be that much harmful to you. So there has to be this proportionality in this last resort um, in order to do that. Um, and so there are there times in history, has there been times when there have been murderers or, or um, people who are so the struggle of society is so wicked, so hurtful, they need to be killed, yes. Probably less so today, less likely today, because we have a better jail system, better, better control over those things. But is it, is it beyond the possibility of ever happening again? No. Um, you know, especially if you have some dictator with an army behind him. You know, he might need to be, to be put down. Uh, that has to be a last resort. It's not simply because he's not a human being. It's never, it should never be hatred or revenge or anger. It's not, I hate this guy, so I'm going to get him. It's, it has to be, I'm putting an end to the wickedness and defending the people he's harmed. Which could be myself, my family, um, other people who can't help themselves. So would that be an argument for the death penalty then? Yeah. In extreme limited cases. Um, is it too widely used? Yes. Um, John Paul II said he's not certain. To, he doesn't believe, John Paul II said he doesn't think there's any cases in the modern Western world where it's necessary. Could be debated. Um, but certainly more and more limited now that we have better jail and stuff. But, but there could be cases. Um, but, but if it's simply out of revenge, you did this to me, so I'm going to get you back, and I'm gonna, but that's not helpful. That's just adding more anger and hatred and bitterness into our lives. And it's not going to fix the problem. I'm going to, if I kill you because I'm, I hate you, I'm not going to then feel better. I'm not going to get back, you know, my, my, my love that I get. Well, I'm just now feeling empty. And I have no one ever, 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 ever to do with it. It's not going to heal me or, or fix things or, or bring back a love. If it's simply out of hatred and revenge. If it's self-defense and protection and as, as the best choice I have, you know, for whatever reason. Um, it's, it's a tragedy still. It's not something we celebrate or rejoice in. But it might be necessary. Might be. Um, but it should be done by the person who has the responsibility, right? I, 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 can't, I can't, as a private citizen, say, I'm going to go into the jail over there and start knocking off the murderers because, you know, or, you, know you, you, you clearly, Daniel, is so wicked. <laughs> I'm going to knock him off. <laughs> to protect all of you. Self-defense, you know, if someone were to come attack my family, if someone were to come to, to try to kill, you know, if someone here, I can defend myself, I can defend, but again, my, my goal is to stop them, I can kill them. And if I end up killing them or to stop them, as a tragedy, it shouldn't be that way because they also deserve respect, a chance to repent, a chance to be healed, a chance to be forgiven. Um, but it might be necessary. They don't have the right to, to harm every the people under my care and myself. So, I, I should be saying, "Why did you kill me? Good luck. Here's your gun back. Here's your axe." You know, self-defense is a good thing, and defending other people is a good thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so, please. <laughs> it's awful awesome, that so okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, back on the board there. Um, you were saying that God doesn't have anger. Correct. And, and anger is an emotion. Correct. And God has love, which is an emotion. Right? Love is both an emotion and also an act of the will. So the thing is... Also a what? An act of the will. Act of oh, the soul. 
So the thing is, we're body and soul creatures. And so, ideally, body and soul, emotion and will and heart and mind are working together. Ideally. If we're doing it right, there's no sense that we've always had that way. Um, we should be able to love people, you know, their bodies, when we speak to them and talk to them and treat them, of their heart and souls, uh, love them their wills and choices. We see there's a disconnect. Right? So we love people simply with our emotions, using people then. People, but we love people simply with our will and our life very much. Um, I've told the story before, but I think, it, to me, it illustrates very clearly. Um, when I was 13, 13 years old, um, me and my older sister went to the treehouse of one of our cottonwood trees. <laughs> now, if I see cottonwood trees, you know, there's no branches in the first 30, 40 feet. And so we're going to come to this tree and we'll dress up the branches and we this hidden fortress and great. And there's no branches to up and hammer and nails and boards. So we started climbing the tree and I'm about 10 feet off the ground. You know, this is stupid. If I slip, I have nothing to catch myself with. Especially if I have a handful, I don't want to do this. It was nice to be the, the, the abstract, but you know what? I don't think so, that. <laughs> my older sister's up there saying, you're a coward, you're a big baby, you know, I do it myself. And I was furious with her. You know, because she, how dare she offend my dignity and call me names. <laughs> As up the tree, I'm on the ground, going back and forth, running to my cell, you know, and she slips. Oh and as angry as I was, I was up the tree in the flash stop her. I loved my sister, but I was really angry with her. I didn't like her at the time. Emotionally, I felt a love for her, but my heart and will I loved um, If you take care of a screaming baby at 3 in the morning, your emotions will not be there. Maybe it will, maybe it won't be. <laughs> but if that can go out and take care of them and change their diaper and feed them and, 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 and soothe them, you're loving them. We love with our souls and with our bodies. Um, if we're use, using somebody simply because we want to use them as little, only with the, the people who we have affection for, but no real love for. Right? So the people who we jump into bed with to use them before night, there's affection there of some kind, desire, attraction but not true love. So the emotions are there, not the heart, not the soul, or the will. So there's a disconnect between us because of original sin, there's this war inside of us. Um, so God has the heart and soul of love, the spiritual side of it, but not the physical body of side, until Christ comes. Um, now Christ does love us with the human heart, that's how emotions for us, um, but God does not. So it doesn't make God's love less. It doesn't make God yeah, for us it's less because we work we're, we're, we're the body and soul. So because we have two parts, we have love with both parts, or it's less. God being complete and whole in Himself, God is not less. God is loving less. He loves something different. Um, but God doesn't have the same in, in that physical, emotional sense. It's like a rock and a little notion. If I run, run if I run my boat into the rock, I'm gonna get messed up. I can't, you know, in the circumstance, I can say the rock was angry, angry, the angry rock prevented me from going forward. Sure, you know, but it's more like the rock didn't change and I changed and crashed into it. God is so good, so just, so true that our sins crash into God and we get they broke. And so we experience that as anger. But it's, it's a poetic analogy because, you know, again, story time. Because a bunch of times the people who are from all stages of life, all places, all time, all cultures. Um, it's simple just to say God is angry. And you can explain later on, well, this doesn't mean that well, you're angry, you lost your temper, lost your cool. Um, and so it's called anger because it's for us to understand. Where if it was, if it was this long discussion of, of philosophy and you know, a lot of people go, what? What happened? God was angry and punished us. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of always thought that it was more like God's consequences. Like, I, I tell you what you're supposed to do, and if you don't do that, those are the consequences. It's like, I'm not going to change the consequences just because you're cute and somebody else isn't, or something like that. That's kind of, yeah. I don't know if I'm viewing it correctly. I, 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 I think that's right. right. I think that's right. But I think one thing I would add, so C.S. Lewis, the guy, he's a great writer. He talks about sometimes the words we use 
can bring along ideas in our minds that can confuse us. Mm-hmm. Not the words we use, but the ideas we have. Mm-hmm. And so, I would, so sometimes we hear that with children, and it's parents who, who say it's the consequences, and behind us a lot of annoyance and frustration, and maybe that's what we're thinking about. No, I wasn't. I but, was thinking okay. about, like, like, instead of him getting angry, he's like, you got to stop doing that, or this is it, the it's, it's not simply God being hands off and saying, okay, guys, or, or God saying, you just all this back to you. God is a change in response to us. Mm-hmm. Right? So God's a change in goodness. And if God were to change according to us, God would, God would be changing. Right. And so that's why I got, like the analogy better of the rock. The rock just is. Now, the, the bad part of the limp, the basic analogy of limps is that the rock and living are for, for, for free. Um, but the rock doesn't change depending on my boat. The rock just is. And the consequence of my actions is completely me crashing. Um, and, and so, yes. But I want to avoid the, the impression that God changes. Okay. That, that, that God is different depending upon us. That God depends upon me to be good, that God depends upon me for, for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, yes, consequences, but just be careful you don't think that God changes who He is, depending upon who I am. Oh, I know. Okay. <laughs> good. good. <laughs> yeah, I, I was yeah. kind of taking yeah. the, the human, yeah. like the divine versus the human. Right. Okay. And how will a child experience the consequences? Mom not angry <laughs> No. Mom said if she was going to spank me if I eat, eat my dinner, and she spanked me, she must have been angry. Well, there was another consequence. I was punished. You know. Well, that's um, kind of what God did. I mean, he yeah. you know, yeah. told through the prophets that this is what's going to happen, and this, you know. Yeah. And very often it is that consequence. It is you do these things, you're going to mess yourself up. You do these things, you're going to end up miserable. But he also gives the other side too. You know, yes. If you do these things, then you will be granted mercy. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, consequences can be positive or negative, right? They are not mm-hmm. always negative. They're not always negative. I also say that I mean, yes. Add to that. Go, yeah. That's what I think about it. I would add to that though is that there's always more God does with good because it's creative. Mm-hmm. He was not creative. And so evil is never creative, never make anything new, it's typically destructive. The good is creative. And so God can always give more and more blessings and use it in greater ways when we're good. Because that's what we're supposed to be. And that's who he is. Good is creative, good makes life. If individuals, and each other, um, yeah. evil is always destructive. I was thinking of it like in the consequences of the flood, yeah. or Sodom and Gomorrah, mm-hmm. or yeah. and again there are warnings. So, but it also has to do with these three things: where the the warning to those around them, limitation so medicine for the people around them, um, limiting evils, and then a last chance effort for their for hands on things. Anyone that's open more who called upon the Lord, the, the, the fire was running down on them, had a chance. It was, it was instantaneous, right? Mm-hmm. They, they had some time to recognize, <laughs> oh, we're in trouble. <coughs> and when you recognized their sinfulness and, and repented, <coughs> the Lord was there. So on day 119, before the flood, if someone came to God and said, with sincerity, honesty, and a willingness to, to listen and follow, they would have been forgiven. Absolutely. And on the boat. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? So this is like Cain was, just like Adam and Eve were, just like uh, Moses was, like David was. And this is a, a constant thing we have to recognize in the scripture. Um, even in hell, hell is eternal uh, because we're unrepentant. <coughs> hell is eternal because of what? We're unrepentant. Oh, we don't change. We don't, don't say sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not because God up there is saying, yes, you burn, you suffer, you deserve that. Um, it's a consequence, but it's because we're on the it's, it's because we refuse. So they had like 120 years to 
So that's kind of like us with thousands of years with the second coming of Christ. We're all going to do the same thing. <laughs> so last day, the last bit of that human nature. Right? I mean, that and and that's why God doesn't tell us on 20. 35 and April 3rd. Right, yeah. Because we went wait, wait, wait last minute. Right. <laughs> we would, Lord, the very clearly does not reveal that it says it's coming. Careful. But he lets it be kind of vague so that we're always preparing, always ready, and not just kind of hedging our bets. Right. But we're not try, trying to uh, walk both paths at the same time. Maybe you're not to this point yet, um, but as far as Noah, mm -hmm. Okay, all these people were in the ark with him, and they were good people. Mm -hmm. And the flood came and destroyed everything. Those people came off the ark, and they were good people when they were, when they went in. Mm -hmm. When they came out, what happened? <laughs> Look at the way people are now. They were good. It's not that original. They were. Have you ever it's lived like in a parents. small camper for too long? Well, and you also. Well, well, the, 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 the story of Noah and the Ark. I wasn't going to go into this, uh, but even one of Adam, even one of Noah's sons, Ham, has some wickedness. Um, later on, a after the flood, mm -hmm. and he does some bad things. Um, Could that be Satan to his influence? I mean, sure. Yeah. We're all fleshed up, right? We carry it inside of us the original sin. We got demons whispering in the ears, tempting us. Mm -hmm. We've got places, person, places, things, makes it easy. Sin's always easy. Because I, I, yeah. I've been told a lot of times that. Satan attacks some of the best people. Of course. The closest to God. Free yeah. source of temptation. He doesn't need to attack the ones he already has. Yeah, right. He, he has them. them. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's, there's a page from free sources. The world, in case of Noah and the Ark, you know, maybe, maybe this was a lot less if there's only eight people there. <laughs> but, you know, so, wasn't, wasn't, so the world is the person, place, and things around us makes it easier to practice. You know, so you have the culture, you have music, you have television that makes certain kinds of sin really easy to commit. You know, the internet makes certain kinds of sin very easy and very, you know, give certain kinds of busy push outs. You know, saying, be greedy, be selfish, be whatever. This, this is good and manly and independent. And, you know, and that's how you get ahead, yeah. Yeah, that's the world. Mm -hmm. The flash of the thing inside of us, our weaknesses, our temptations. There were sometimes things look good to us. I feel, you know, you know, you're sitting there, I don't feel like it work today. I feel like being nice to this person today. This is, it's not always the devil, it's not just, <laughs> it's hard. You know, and then there's, then there is the devil. There are, there are several, these thousands of fallen angels trying to corrupt us, they hate us, they hate God, and they want to destroy us. And they're going to try to make us so attractive and easy, whisper to our ears, don't listen to God, God's a liar. You'll be happy you do this. Absolutely. So we got the world, the flesh, and the devil all tempting us. Uh, Christ, of course, has the flesh be the case on the world for the devil. So question for you guys now, this is seven twenty. <laughs> so we can stop here and continue next week with this. I mean it's gonna quite quite less I was hoping to. You can see there's so much, it's so great, right? There's so much here. Um, so we can stop here, or we can keep going. I, mean, I live here. You guys <laughs> you all have you have to travel and drive. And so and some of you have a, a ways to travel. So it, it's 7.20. Uh, we can keep going, or we can just end here and pick up next week. I think Abraham is a small topic that might take a little time. There's still a few things here that I wanted to cover. We need right. to touch upon. Some really good questions here. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. I think it's a good stuffing point. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, we don't want this. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your attention. Let's close with prayer then. Any other questions before we close? Any other questions or comments? Or? I got all kinds of notes. <laughs> Good. I had some revelations. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy to us.
the, thank you for the fact you always call us to yourself and always love us. May we hear your voice today and recognize your call. And know not simply facts about you, not simply things what you've done for us, but know you and love you and we live with you forever and eternity. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.